Well, it's a lovely day and I've just recently got myself some portable solar panels. So what better way to test them than rigging up a makeshift chemistry lab in my back garden and making some of my own homemade DIY hydrogen. What could possibly go wrong? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. So what's going on and how do I propose to make my own hydrogen? Well, the plan is to do it via electrolysis. I've got my plastic container here with two upturned bottles of water and another larger bottle of water here, both of which have got a few tablespoons of baking soda in them and the baking soda is just there to make the water a better electrolyte or a conductor of electricity. So I'm gonna pour this water into there, take the caps off those bottles to keep that water in there and then I've got these two pencil leads, pencil refill leads, they're basically sticks of graphite, and they're gonna act as our electrodes, one negative and one positive, which I'll get up inside those bottles in a moment. And then I've got my portable solar panel, which is my source of renewable energy. And fortunately, these panels come conveniently with their own crocodile clips, and I can plug it in whenever I'm ready. And these clips are gonna go on the end of these electrolytes, electrodes rather, uh, to allow the current to flow. So. Let me get all that set up and then we'll press the go switch. So that's the electrodes into the water bottles uh, in our solution. Now in theory, as soon as I plug this end of the wire into this solar panel, we should start seeing gases bubbling up into those bottles. Hopefully twice as fast in this one, which is the negative electrode, than in this one because there's two hydrogen atoms for every oxygen atom in water. So twice as many ions or electro electrons are gonna be going into uh, this bottle as they are into this bottle. So. Let's plug it in and see what happens. So that's going to take a few minutes to do its thing and fill up the bottle and push all the water back out into the solution. I'm going to go and mow the lawn, come back in a few minutes and we'll see how we're getting on. Right, so now we've got a bottle of what we think is full of hydrogen. So let's disconnect the power supply and then just take those out carefully and put our cap back on. We can capture that gas in the bottle. Now, just dried everything off, we can get this match to stay. It's quite windy today, but if we can get it to Day, we should be able to hear an audible pop. I saw a little flame there as well. Not much gas in there, not under much pressure either, so it doesn't give a huge explosion, but at least enough to show that there was gas in there. So on that amazing bombshell of a demonstration, it's back to me in the cabin. So in the last program, we looked at battery storage for electrical grid systems and domestic microgrid systems. But batteries are one of only several ways that energy can be effectively stored. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and it's a great energy carrier. It's got a very high level of energy per unit of mass. A couple of slight snags, it's very reactive, so in real life it's generally bonded to other elements as a compound. And in order to free the hydrogen from that compound, you have to shove in a bunch of energy to break those bonds, which is exactly what the electrolysis was doing earlier on. And secondly, once it's finally been released, hydrogen is a very low density gas at room temperature. In fact, it's about three times less dense than natural gas, for example. So in order to store it and use it in any kind of practical way, we either have to pressurize it to something like between 100 and 300 times atmospheric pressure, 
so that we can get it into canisters that we can transport in a practical way or we have to get it extremely cold like about minus 250 degrees celsius so that we can make it into a liquid which again we can store and transport both these things of course require a large amount of energy but in compressed form it contains about 40,000 watt hours of energy per kilogram which compares to about 280 watt hours of energy per kilogram that the best lithium ion batteries can produce today and all the energy that's required can be produced with renewable technologies so if you can scale that up you really have got yourself a potentially transformational solution for all sorts of applications and when you convert the hydrogen back to produce usable energy by reacting it with oxygen again the only byproduct is water no noxious gases or horrible co2 emissions and that not only makes it a great candidate for fuel cells in vehicles but also for large-scale energy storage on the grid now it's true to say that despite all this abundantly free energy human beings did still originally manage to find a way of producing hydrogen that allowed them to still involve fossil fuels and carbon dioxide. That method is called methane steam reforming and it's widely used in industrial hydrogen production, particularly in the United States. We covered steam reforming in a previous video, which you can have a look up by clicking up there. So I'm not gonna go into detail about that in today's program. Instead, the focus of today's video is on hydrogen produced from electrolysis for mass energy storage. The big energy producers have been developing this concept for some time now. It's something they call power to gas or P to G. And in the case of grid storage, you can pretty much think of that hydrogen like a battery that can produce electricity as and when it's needed. So those industry bods have called that power to gas to power or P to G to P. One of the big advantages hydrogen storage has over battery storage is the length of time it can be stored for. Batteries are best suited to being discharged within relatively short timescales like hours rather than days, but hydrogen can be stored for weeks or months. And as long as you've got enough space, you can just dump more and more storage tanks on site, giving you extra power capacity whenever you need it. And it's exactly this kind of scalability and storability that's gonna be needed as renewable technologies form a larger and larger proportion of our national electricity grids. In fact, within a few short years, possibly only a couple of decades from now, renewable technologies are predicted to provide the vast majority of energy for the new smart grids that are being planned or implemented all over the globe. And that means we'll most likely need seasonal energy storage. Hydrogen is the perfect candidate for this. During the summer months, when you're producing far more electricity than you need from your solar and your wind, you can just squirrel all that energy away by storing it in hydrogen. And then during the darker winter months, you can convert that stored energy back into electricity as and when you need it. And because hydrogen is immediately convertible back to electricity, it can also be used as a grid balancer, smoothing out the spikes in demand in the same way that lithium ion batteries do today. Here in Europe, renewable technologies already represent a fairly significant proportion of grid power. So several pilot projects are already well underway to establish how best to include hydrogen storage into the overall energy provision mix. In 2016, the Energy Technologies Institute in the UK started a trial using salt caverns at three locations in the north of the country. Salt caverns have been used for many years to store various types of gases for the chemical industry like methane and chlorine. So using them to store hydrogen seems like quite a smart move. Some of these caverns are extremely deep, perhaps as high as the Eiffel Tower, and in some cases exceeding a million cubic meters in volume. Hydrogen gas gets pumped in at high pressure, and then when extra electricity needs to be generated for the grid, the gas is allowed to flow out over a turbine but it can also be fed into the existing gas pipelines for domestic heating without any alteration to the system. And that makes it a very alternative substitute product to facilitate the phase out of natural methane gas heating for our homes. More about that in a future program. According to this report by John Parnell for Forbes Online, a similar system of around 100 megawatts has been installed in the United Arab Emirates and projects are also underway in Australia and of course in China. But it looks like, at least on this occasion, China doesn't win the accolade for biggest hydrogen storage facility in the world. Nope, that prize goes to a project in Utah in the good old US of A. 
There's a lot of salt in Utah and Mormons. The project, run jointly by Mitsubishi and Salt Cavern owners Magnum Development, aims to achieve a one gigawatt power rating. The Forbes report tells us that Mitsubishi has developed a gas turbine for power plants that can operate efficiently with a mixture of natural gas and hydrogen. It has sketched out a technology roadmap that will eventually see a gas turbine using exclusively hydrogen. If the electrolysis used to create the hydrogen is powered by renewables, then that hydrogen can be considered a renewable energy source. These storage technologies look like becoming essential elements of the smart grid rollout as we strive to move away from harmful fossil fuels as fast as possible. Let's just remind ourselves how far off we are from meeting either the 1.5 degrees Celsius or even the 2 degrees Celsius targets set out in the 2015 Paris Agreement. This chart shows our global CO2 emissions in gigatons per year. The curve is currently going in a relentlessly upward direction, leading us to 4 or 5 degrees of extra warming by the end of the century. It actually needs to start going in the opposite direction in a very short period of time, and it's radical new technologies like hydrogen storage that will help achieve these extremely challenging goals. In the next programme we'll be taking a closer look at that hydrogen for heating idea that I talked about a moment ago and we'll also be reviewing the latest developments in hydrogen fuel cell technologies. That's it for this week though. Please do give us a like and a share if you found the programme useful and informative and a massive thank you to the nearly 1,000 new subscribers who've joined the channel just in the last seven days. Your support really is hugely appreciated. The more subscribers we get, the more visible we are to the YouTube search engines and the more people get to hear about the climate challenges and solutions that are being worked on around the globe. If you haven't already subscribed, it's dead easy and free to do that. All you need to do is click on that link there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.